for the first of two short slideshows about performance and refactoring. The first one is about performance. So the question is, how do we improve performance? And obviously, I mean database um, application performance. And there are four ways to do it. The first way is to reduce network traffic. The second way is to limit disk I.O. The third way is to optimize driver application interaction. And the fourth way is to improve or optimize our queries. So let's talk about first um, reducing network traffic. Actually, this is the main one that we'll talk about. How can you do that? Well, the obvious way to do it is to use connection pools. Connection pools reduce network traffic. So what is a connection pool? It's a cache of DB connections that's available for reuse. So a connection pool helps when uh, an application on a server has multiple users. A connection pool has uh, open connections already that you can just grab and use and return as soon as you're done with them. Now in order to use them, a database server needs adequate memory for maximum connections. So a connection pool has some limited number of maximum connections. Uh, and it also has to have, the server has to have uh, adequate licenses for maximum connections. Even though we all, may all hate Oracle, that's still the most popular database and we need licenses to, uh, to run it. And uh, SQL Server the same way. Um, we need licenses to, to operate these. Obviously for um, open source databases like MySQL or um, PostgreSQL, we don't have that problem. Connection pool management. So you open the connection just before we use it, and then we return the connection to the pool just after we use it. Um, and we don't always use connection pools. Connection pools are, are optional. Uh, there are applications that don't have an application server, so they're not going to benefit from connection pools. There are applications that restart frequently. They're not going to benefit from application, I mean, from connection pools. Did I say application pools? Oh, well. Uh, single user applications obviously don't benefit from connection pools. And periodic jobs like logging that can be scheduled don't benefit from connection pools. Background jobs that run at slack times, which would be an example of, of uh, you know, periodic jobs, um, don't benefit from connection pools. Now, um, there are a lot of blogs about SQL Server that endorse uh, third-party connection management tools and connection management consultants because of the complexity of connection pools. Uh, and in the study guide, I report on an argument over opening and closing uh, DB connections in the same method. Should you, you know, open the connection, use it, and close it in the same method? Not everybody agrees about that. So there's a um, <clears throat> report in the study guide also of a blogger who profiles application servers to find connection pooling issues. That's, that's his job. Now there are four possible connection states. We can um, precede the connect by a commitment or a rollback. The connect fails if preceded by any uh, SQL except for connect, commit, release, rollback, or set connection. And here's a picture from IBM of um, possible connection states and how you can go from one state to the other. So we begin the process in the upper left. We're connectable and connected and we can get into the state of being unconnectable but connected. We can get into the state of being connectable and unconnected. And from the unconnectable and connected state, we can also get into a state of being unconnectable and unconnected. So, um, and, and this diagram gives us the, the ways that we can go from one state to the other. Now there are some uh, DBS specific connection management issues as I mentioned before. In particular, SQL Server dominates the traffic that I see online about connection management issues. And the question in my mind is why? And I, I don't have a, an answer to this. It's either popularity of SQL Server or community approaches. So this, this community may approach 
um, connection management issues in a very public way in comparison with other databases. By the way, how do you assess popularity? One way I assess popularity is by job listings. Um, and with a um, keyword like SQL, it's difficult to um, uh, assess the popularity in job listing. If you, if you put in the keyword SQL, um, along with uh, SQL Server, you'll get, a, you know, it, it, along with the word server, you'll get a lot of uh, irrelevant uh, hits at Indeed or Dice. Uh, another way is Stack Overflow traffic. That's a little bit better because it's a little bit, the tags make a little bit more sense. Um, there are rankings on DB engines. And one question uh, I, I might have about that that I, I don't know the answer to is um, who is really the audience for dbengines.com? Uh, who are they trying to uh, speak to? For example, with the Gartner Magic Quadrant um, on any issue, we know that Gartner is speaking to its clients, and its clients are, are generally you know, big old brick-and-mortar enterprises that buy Gartner reports. And so we know that um, the things that appeal to them are not necessarily the same things that appeal to us. They, they can, there can be overlap, but at least we have some idea of who the audience is. And the same thing is true of Stack Overflow. We have some idea of who the audience is. DB Engines, I don't have as much of an idea of who the audience is. Um, we could say it's people interested in databases, but that's kind of an amorphous group. Okay, so another um, way that we can um, manage is with statement pooling, uh, which is also called statement caching. And uh, this simply means that frequently reused statements are cached. And the way that statement pooling uh, works is, well, statement pooling works if Java is the development language because Java garbage collection is aggressive. Uh, so it's useful to do statement pooling in an in an atmosphere where uh, garbage collection is aggressive, so you're you're going to lose the statements uh, otherwise. So uh, in statement pooling, each application has a connection pool, each connection has a statement pool, and each statement has a query and result set. And the result set is not cached; just the query is. And so here's a diagram um, that, that I think is also from IBM. Um, that shows this kind of, kind of setup. And I think actually the top of this diagram is cut off, unfortunately. So the, the, uh, let me just say that the rectangle in the uh, upper left-hand corner, the black rectangle, is a web application. And the rectangle in the upper right corner, the green rectangle, is a data source. So um, the web application has data sources within it, and each of those data sources has a connection pool within it, and each of those connection pools has a statement pool within it, and each of those statement pools have statements within them. So, uh, and uh, and have the statement consists of a query and a result set, and um, so we cache the um, the query, not the result set. So statement pooling may not be optional. Um, for example, um, Apache MyBatis is a persistence framework, and Apache MyBatis uh, op automates this mapping between SQL statements and Java methods. So it's different from an ORM. An ORM would map relational tables to Java objects, and um, Apache MyBatis uh, uh, automates the mapping between SQL statements and Java methods. And in Apache MyBata, the reason that I bring this up is that in Apache MyBata, statement pooling is not optional. Uh, all statements are passed as prepared statements. And the developer controls a setting uh, specifying the number of SQL statements to cache, and that setting is called max statements. So the only question that you have to answer if you're using Apache MyBata is um, what is the number of statements because the number of statements not the size matters so uh, and that's just one example of a persistence framework you might use an, another uh, persistence framework but let's say you're using that one how large should max statements be so the default for JDBC is 500 
and that's good for 250 kilobytes of SQL statements. So let's say, for example, we have 250 megabytes for uh, 10,000 queries and 50 connections. We're assuming there that um, we have 500 bytes per SQL, which is a pretty generous assumption, and 10,000 statements and 50 connections. Okay, now another question um, that uh, is related to performance is what is the information about the machine you're running on? Um, this is something that I expect you to have in your performance milestone. Um, I expect you to use terminal commands to find out information about the machine that you're running. Here are a few terminal commands you can use. Uname-a uh, works on pretty much any Unix or Linux uh, system, Mac OS system. Uh, LSB release only works on some Linux systems that there is an association which LSB is an abbreviation for. I can't remember the name of the association right now, but there is an association of uh, Linux uh, distribution producers that try to increase the interoperability between different flavors of, of Linux, and they've instituted this uh, LSB release function that tells us which uh, version of Linux is running. That's not going to work, for example, on Gibson. So if you happen to have your um, project hosted on Gibson, um, you'll find if you if you uh, just say ls space uh, slash etc, uh, you'll find a um, Red Hat release um, um, file in the in the Etsy directory, and that. Uh, Red Hat release file tells you that, that that you're in fact running some version of Red Hat and if you look in that file it'll tell you you're running Red Hat Enterprise Server or something or other. Um, so that's a way of getting that information on uh, on Gibson. I think on uh, Serenity you'll find if you're hosting your project on Serenity um, you'll find it's running CentOS and I think um, CentOS also does not subscribe to the LSB uh, uh, interoperability uh, functions. So this particular function isn't going to help you on those, those machines, but it might help you on other machines. Um, and by the way, Gibson, I think, is a synonym for Banjo. I think that um, the, uh, the powers that be will actually like you to... Um, log into Banjo if you're doing a, uh, um, you know, like a, just an RIT generic application. Um, and then DF-H means uh, disk free, so that will list all your disks, and the dash H will give it to you in human readable format. Normally it's specified in blocks, which is not an easy thing for, for people to wrap their heads around. So the dash H will give it in um, bytes and megabytes and gigabytes and, and so on. Um, for the, the shared um, uh, machines here at RIT, Serenity and, and Gibson, for example, the output of DF space dash H is kind of, can be kind of hard to read um, because you get a partition and it lists all the partitions, so there's actually an entry for each user. Um, so that makes it a, a real pain to read in, in, in the uh, Red Hat um, universe. Uh, du space dash h tells us how much disk space has been used, so it's kind of the opposite of D, df uh, in the sense that it's disk used instead of uh, disk free. But you need to know these uh, these things. You can you can um, summarize these. You know, you, you with du you by default get a uh, a reading get a you get a line of text for every uh, item that's that's using up disk space, which is you know potentially a lot of items. Um, you can you can summarize uh, this just if you say man du or man df. You can get uh, summaries of these um, 
of the output of, of these that will perhaps be more useful for you. But anyway, you should include some machine info in your design document under performance. And why is that? Uh, well, because someone else who's running your app should know if their environment differs drastically from yours. Um, it, the performance of your app may be drastically different on somebody on a client's machine um, because you know they're they're not uh, um, they're just not running under an environment similar to yours. Uh, by the way, in the study guide, I give a lot more commands that you can type in to um, to find out machine information. Um, so there is other performance info that you should consider. Uh, for example, um, PHP version. If you're using PHP uh, on Serenity, that will reveal that the Mongo module is loaded. Um, you can use CURL to get response time. Uh, you can use Chrome DevTools network panel to get load time. Uh, you can't use Fire. I say may use Firebug. I should remove that because Firebug now um, doesn't work under the latest versions of uh, of Firefox, so it's it's uh, kind of obsolete. Um, you might use multiple virtual machines to avoid caching problems. So this, if you're using Arlis, for example, um, you might do you might um, want to use mul multiple virtual machines um, to keep from having problems with ca caching. Um, if you're using C Sharp, which actually you probably shouldn't be using in this class, um, you would describe a background worker like threading. Uh, the reason I say you shouldn't be using it in this class is because it doesn't run on, as far as I know, on our virtual machine, which I use for grading in this class, but um, you may use it in, in uh, other environments. And people have told me that there are uh, packages that will allow it to run on our virtual machine. I haven't used any of these packages yet. Um, you should check into persistence frameworks. You should check into caching SQL statements. If you're using MySQL, you should use the limit clause so that you know you, if you have a, a giant uh, database, you don't just randomly return an enormous number of records. Um, that's a performance issue. Okay, so those are all the performance issues that I want to talk about for now. The next stop is refactoring. So that's the end of this uh, short video, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again on the next one.